Well, right at the end of our last session, I was just mentioning to you how in, in the world of prevention, uh, you know, we find sometimes that prevention is the only way. And in the early days with AIDS, uh, we found we just had to come up with a way to educate people uh, about how to avoid getting infected because we had very little to offer. Now, that concept actually got broader too because not only was there a problem with the people who were being infected and, and, and the terrible horror that that brought into their lives, but there was all of this prejudice against them. And so this aid center uh, decided to start a program to educate the police in the city of Chicago, 12,000 policemen, about people who had AIDS or people who are HIV positive. And the reason was that the police were finding that they would corner a criminal and, and they would be just about to take the person into custody. And the person may have committed some pretty serious felony. Uh, they may have shot someone or you know, robbed a store or whatever. But the person would say, I have AIDS, and if you touch me, I'm going to spit on you and you'll get infected. Well, in the early days, people thought you could get infected maybe by having someone spit on you. So the police would let the person go. Uh, or they might do something fairly violent to the person, since the person was threatening to harm them. And so we decided to run a program in which we actually educated the entire police force in the city of Chicago in groups of 50. And one thing wonderful about the police, it really is like the military. I mean, if the, if, the, if the sergeant says to 50 police officers, you will be in this room at this time, 49 don't show up, 50 show up. And, uh, and so we were able to educate the police force. Well, th they came back later telling us they were so much more comfortable once they found out about how the infection really occurs that uh, then they became, and also they became more empathic towards people who were infected. So they, they developed all the positive things we wanted them to develop. And again, you know, we prevented probably inappropriate behavior on the part of the police and enabled them to do their job better. Okay, now I want to move on to research, since that's a big part of what clinical psychologists are trained in. And, and it has been a constant theme in psychology over and over again about why do we train all these people in research when most of them don't do any research later? And, and the field has maintained over many struggles that we still are going to teach people how to be sophisticated researchers because it teaches them a certain critical mindset that at least many of us old timers think is very important. That, that people think about what are you doing and is the intervention you're making now the best intervention you can make? Uh, or if you have an idea uh, about a better way to intervene, can you develop a, a, a plan where we can examine whether or not your idea really is good or not? That is, do the people who get your new treatment do better than the people who got the older treatment? And, and we feel that you, know, you need to do this in a systematic way and show scientifically whether something works or doesn't work which is very different than just going on your impulses. And there's actually a lot of stress today on, on, on psychologists doing this. In fact, we now have a, a, what we call empirically validated interventions, EVIs. And, and the field today has got to the point where psychologists are saying, you should only teach in graduate school those interventions that there is some evidence to suggest actually work. Uh, so you don't just teach for the sake uh, you know, a very broad number of interventions and, uh, and feel you, know, you want to give people lots of opportunities to have different things to work with. You want to teach people to use interventions that somehow we have determined work well. Now, what we've learned, by the way, I think one of the most important things with uh, these uh, EBIs is that interventions that work with one group of uh, problems don't work necessarily work with another group of problems. And so we're learning not only what intervention works, but what intervention works with what problem. Now, we're ahead of ourselves with EBIs in the sense there are obviously are some treatments that are very complex that we haven't been able to study adequately. And so they may be very effective in some ways, and they still get used. 
uh, with a lack of experimental evidence. But we're going, I think, in the right direction of trying to really determine uh, what intervention is right with what person and what circumstance. Clinical psychologists also teach. And actually, they teach in a wider uh, arena than you, you might expect. Obviously, teaching in a university is, is one you would expect. But uh, often, psychologists teach courses in medical schools, teach in colleges of business, teach in law, teach in colleges of education. Uh, I myself have taught in all of those areas. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's very different. And it's really fascinating to have the opportunity to introduce psychology into areas that uh, previously uh, psychology wasn't taught. And in some cases, uh, in fact, more and more, for instance, business schools are teaching a lot of psychology. I mean, they, they recognize that. Law schools are finally teaching psychology. And, and of course, uh, there's still a serious problem that we don't teach enough psychology in medical schools. That is, young physicians really don't learn as much as they need to learn about interviewing techniques, about the emotional state of their patients. That's in spite of the fact that uh, there is impressive research that at least 50% of the people who present uh, to internists and to general practitioners have a significant psychological problem. There is some research uh, even to suggest that it is their only problem. That is, if you dealt with their psychological problem, their physical problems would go away. And there's fascinating research on this to show that one of the big controversies today in healthcare is what will the healthcare people pay for? And mostly they don't want to pay for psychological intervention. That's in spite of the fact that there's incredible research to show that if you offer unlimited mental health benefits in a healthcare plan, that is, you want to go and see a psychologist, a social worker, a psychiatrist, a psychiatric nurse, et cetera, if you want to go, and, and you need a lot of sessions, you need to go for a year or two, that if you pay for all of that in your health care plan, the total cost of health care will go down. That is, instead, since people don't get their mental health care paid for, they go in with physical problems. They come in with headaches, they come in with stomach aches, they come in with ulcers, they come in with high blood pressure. I mean, all kinds of things that are very psychologically determined. And in spite of the research, and by the way, the, this research works whether you're talking about uh, any uh, ethnic group or any race, works across all races, works across all socioeconomic levels. You want to name any population, this, this has been studied. And in every one of those populations, it has been shown. If you have unlimited mental health benefits, those, the total cost of those people's health care will go down. Now, in spite of that, the insurance industry is going the opposite way today. I mean, the insurance companies are trying harder and harder not to pay mental health benefits, which is a real tragedy. And we're still not teaching our physicians enough about uh, the interventions that are needed to help people overcome a lot of their psychological difficulties. Now, the other area, if you remember, I was saying there were six areas. There is consultation. And this is really an exciting area. And psychologists consult to school systems. They consult to social service providers. They uh, consult to multinational corporations. And, uh, and, and these are really uh, challenging things to do. And, uh, but they make differences. Uh, I can give you a couple of, of personal examples, I think, that are, I can disguise enough. One was I was consulting to a multinational corporation where the head of the corporation was being, had a person who had previously worked there, and the person was threatening to murder the head of the corporation. Now, this person was a very, obviously, put it mildly, a disgruntled employee, <laughs> former employee. But the, what was tricky with this is that, obviously, you know, if you think about this, if someone was threatening to take your life, you would probably not function as well as you're functioning right now. The problem is, you make the decisions, or oversee the decisions, that involve billions of dollars. So we can't afford to have you dysfunctional. On the other hand, the fact that someone threatens in a semi-veiled way to end someone's life is not enough to get him arrested. I mean, the police won't go and arrest a guy because he makes a threat like that. They say he's a disgruntled employee. 
So the consultation became around how do you, uh, first of all, assessing what do you think is the risk that this person may actually do this, because it's a very serious act. And secondly, how do you help the, uh, the CEO of a company to become comfortable enough that that person uh, can do his job? And uh, so, so you, you end up with you know, a very significant challenge. And it, and it becomes important you do it well, because I mean, an awful lot of people who are working at that company could be hurt. An awful lot of investors could be hurt. I mean, many things could happen. Another one I remember, I worked with a, a man who, um, again, person who was involved with a multinational corporation. In his case, he, he was responsible for hundreds of millions of dollars. And in fact, this is a case I, I will tell you about later when we talk about psychotherapy. But the key issue was the man had to travel a lot. I mean, his job, and, and for years he had been traveling all around the world. And suddenly he became phobic for flying. And which meant he couldn't do his job, obviously. And, and there were a lot of complications in this, which I'll describe as an example of, of what goes on in psychotherapy. But the consultation part of it was simply the company wanted to be sure that this man, who was very talented and very important to the company, was able to function. And they didn't want him to change jobs. I mean, he was already doing what they wanted him to do, but his, it involved him flying most of the time. Now. Also, psychologists get involved in administration. And, and they end up in administration in a variety of ways. Uh, often what happens is somebody just develops a sense after they've been working in the field for a while that I could run whatever unit or organization I'm in well. I think I could make the place better. So people do things like to become a department chair, like here at the University of Houston. You have Dr. David Francis, who is the department chair. Or you become the director of like, clinical training, uh, where Dr. John Vincent is in that role. Or you have a psychologist running the student counseling service, like Dr. Ken Waldman. Uh, but psychologists also get involved in things like being superintendents of schools, being the chief psychology, uh, the chief of service uh, in a general hospital, being the director of a state mental health center, uh, even the manager of a government agency. Uh, the director of a multidisciplinary psychology unit like the, they have in the Veterans Administration now. Uh, and then some psychologists go into administration and, and basically they seemingly leave the field of psychology. That is, they, they become deans, they become provosts, uh, they become presidents or chancellors uh, in universities. Uh, there are even psychologists now who are U.S. senators. So we, and, and, and one is actually well served. It's amazing how uh, often uh, you find that your psychology background, uh, you know, really comes into play uh, if you're in an administrative role. I mean, it does help, especially if you've been trained in group dynamics. And, and, but, uh, but you, I can tell you, the individual person has to undergo a change. And I remember when I left Northwestern, I, uh, I went to become a dean. And I had to go back uh, about three months after I was dean for a, a student's doctoral dissertation that I was chairing. And they had decided, since I'd left early in the summer, they wanted to hold this party, this reception, uh, after I came back. So after I came back, I'd been dean for three months. And all kinds of friends were coming up to me saying, what's it like to be a dean? And I said, well, I said, you know, the, the one really big change in my life is that when I was here at Northwestern, and there was someone in, in my office who was really crazy, it was very clear that I was a doctor and this person's a patient. So when you become a dean, you end up with all kinds of crazy people in your office, but they don't know that you're the doctor and they're the crazy person. And so you have to deal with them very differently. And the premises change. And you've got to realize that you know, your kind of position of authority that you once had is not going to work in this situation. These people think that they certainly know more than you, and they're there to accuse you of all kinds of bad things. And you've got to change your lifestyle if you want to be effective with this. Now, also, some other factors about this field you might want to know. Uh, gender balance is changing dramatically in clinical psychology. Uh, in 1950, 15% of doctoral degrees in clinical psychology went to women. 15% in 1950. By 1997, 67% of doctoral degrees in psychology went uh, to women. And what happened uh, 
you know, during this time, people began getting worried that uh, psychology was becoming too feminized. Too many women in the field. Who do you suppose, by the way, was most worried about this? Men. <laughs> See, you would think that. You would say men, but it wasn't. It was women who were most worried about this. And, in fact, it was women who often brought this up. Men couldn't bring it up because it was politically incorrect. But women brought this up all the time at meetings. You know, how come we're taking all these women graduate students? Well, and the worry, of course, was that in other disciplines that have become predominantly female, often the discipline, uh, the, the pay rate goes down, uh, and sometimes even the status of the discipline decreases. And, and these, obviously, are very, very bright women. Well, the truth is, in psychology, I personally think it's just a non-issue. Because in psychology, for the last 15 years or so, if, if you look at graduate schools across the country, and you can ask any dean of a graduate school, what is the top program in your, in top doctoral program in your university? It's very rare that someone won't say it's clinical psychology, if you're asking about who has the brightest students. Everybody will say clinical psychology is the brightest students. So the reality is that even though we have many more women in clinical psychology, we don't have a random sample of women. What we have are basically the brightest women in the country are choosing to go into the field. Now, any field that's getting the brightest in the country, it doesn't matter whether they're males or females, is obviously going to thrive. So, personally, I think it's a non-issue that we just happen to now be attracting more women. Uh, the, the fact is that the, the people who come in are so bright that uh, they just do extremely well. Now, also I will mention, by the way, that later on when I talk with you about getting into graduate school, there are other avenues that have been developed for people who may not score terribly high on tests but have lots of talent and could get doctoral degrees in psychology, but I'll, I'll bring that up later. The other issue is minorities. And psychology was a very white profession. Uh, and in fact, in 1985, only 7% of psychologists were members of minority groups. And, and the field has been very concerned about that, and there's been a very concentrated effort to try to recruit uh, people of various cultures and races into the field. And now psychology is close to having 25% of its graduate students are from minorities. And of course, uh, it's just terribly important that we be successful with that because there are so many minority populations who are in need of psychologists and they're going to be more accepting of people that they see uh, as having a sensitivity to their issues. But that's a decided improvement. And of course, you know, you, you, when you're talking about uh, this, you, you're, you're not randomly, again, talking. You're talking about the very brightest people and the various groups that we're talking about. So, you know, you're out there competing with all the other disciplines who also want these very bright people. And yet psychology has been successful in getting a large population of minority students to choose to come into the field. Now... Let me tell you just a little bit about the, the history of the field from the perspective I said at the beginning. You know, the field's only started since the Second World War. And actually, the, you can trace back to, uh, to what happened in the Second World War as, as uh, just changing the very sense of, of our culture and the very sense of psychology. First of all, we're talking about a world war. And when the United States entered it, uh, they needed people to do assessments uh, about who's prepared uh, for leadership positions uh, in, in the armed forces. And psychologists were called upon to do that. Now, uh, in, in many cases, you know, I don't think we did all that great a job because back then we used IQ tests. And often it was if somebody was bright uh, and somebody had, uh, you know, seemingly good verbal skills, uh, they were put in these programs to become leaders. But the fact was, psychologists were determine, determining who's going to get into leadership roles uh, in the military. Uh, but then, they also examined individuals who might not be fit to serve in battle. Uh, you know, people who could not handle the, the level of anxiety that you would experience in you know, going to battle. And in those days, I mean, you know, there was really great danger of death. And so what happened 
was psychologists uh, did these assessments, and so people went into other areas where perhaps they might not have to go into battle, which was important because uh, you didn't want to send people out where you knew they would just be overwhelmed by what was going to happen. Then psychologists began assessing people coming back from, first of all, in battle, and coming back from battle, people who had anxiety attacks while they were in the armed forces, people who had psychotic episodes while they were uh, in, in battle. And we learned some interesting things. Uh, one of the things was, you've all heard of traumatic stress disorders, in common kind of thing today. And, and we learned there is such a thing as traumatic stress disorder. I mean, that people who seemingly have no uh, history of, uh, of having any kind of psychological disorder prior to being exposed to some trauma, like shooting people and getting shot at, uh, actually develop symptoms and become terrified. And had they not been in that situation, they, there's no reason to assume they ever would have developed such severe symptoms. And psychologists began learning interventions. Uh, one of the first things you learned is you've got to intervene right away. Uh, it became important, for example, if you don't intervene at the front, like right up where the war is being conducted, if you bring the people back to the states, they, they will take way, way longer to get better. They may not get better. Uh, if you intervene while they're in the front, many people were able to overcome their anxiety and they went back into battle and became productive soldiers. Uh, and that, that was a real breakthrough in, in, in getting to, to understand that kind of thing. Now, the, the actual beginnings of clinical psychology, I'm just going to digress a moment and take you back maybe 50 years earlier, that, that, because this is, everybody tells you this, this information, that the founder of uh, psychology is a man named Leitner Whitmer. Leitner Whitmer got his undergraduate degree at the University of Pennsylvania, and he went to Germany and studied under a very famous psychologist named Wilhelm Wundt. So he, his degree was in experimental psychology. But he came back to the United States, and he went to the University of Pennsylvania, and they decided they wanted him to start a clinic. So he started a psychological clinic. And, uh, and he had great freedom because nobody knew what a psychological clinic was. There, there, there weren't any before this. And, and the people in the school systems began bringing him children that, uh, that were having problems in school. So the very first effort in clinical psychology was really in child clinical psychology. And, and this was not a man, by the way, who spent a lot of time uh, working with IQs. At, at that time, for instance, the famous test uh, was the Stanford Binet IQ test. But that's not what he was using. For the most part, he was interviewing these children and sometimes their parents. And he, but uh, always with the focus on trying to help the troubled youngster uh, to function better in school. Then when the First World War came, psychologists actually got involved as far back as that. Now we're back, we're talking 1917, 1918. And they were, psychologists were pressed to help uh, identify those who were ready to serve in these various military roles. And by 1918, psychologists had conducted evaluations of nearly two million men who were then uh, potential recruits for the military. Now, a number of tests were developed uh, during the next period before the Second World War. Uh, and this is when the, we began realizing that not only was IQ important, but there were a lot of other tests which we're going to discuss when we get to psychological testing. But just to, to give you a flavor for this, we had a word association test developed. And this is when you, you give someone a word, you say, and usually you choose somewhat neutral words. Uh, you know, like you say white, uh, or you say um, lawn, or you give, and you see what kinds of responses you get from people. And then you choose, uh, and white, by the way, might be a very emotionally loaded word. I probably shouldn't have chosen that as one of them. You might say street. Uh, but then you choose things like mother, uh, or father, spouse, etc. And you often find that people will respond very differently to the emotionally loaded words. Uh, and, 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 and when they do, often they kind of distort that concept. So we began learning that just uh, getting people to respond to word association told us a lot about their personality. Now we're gonna soon talk about 
personality uh, itself. And, and what you were finding here was that with the emotionally loaded words, what the belief was is that unconscious responses come out. And you get to know things about a person that you couldn't know any other way except through this test. Now, the Rorschach inkblot test, which was developed by a psychiatrist by the name of Herman Rorschach, uh, was also developed, uh, and you can see, in the 1920s. And it became a very important test. And that was followed. We had the draw a person test, where you literally told people to draw a person. Sometimes you told people to draw uh, a family scene. You gave very specific instructions. But the way in which people were drawn uh, became important. Then the strong vocational interest test was developed, which was a test to kind of help people select what field should you be in. You know, do you want to be an engineer? Do you have a lot of like mechanical skills? Or do you want to be a poet that you've got a lot of creative skills? And it was to kind of help people who were feeling, I don't know what I want to be, to at least find out where people who had interests similar to them were. So by taking this test, depending on what you scored high on, you would be told, well, people who score similarly to you have done well in such and such fields and have tended to avoid other fields. And there's been a huge amount of research on that since then. Then the thematic apperception test uh, was developed. Uh, I won't spend any time on it now because I'm going to talk about it later. But it, it again was what is called a projective personality test. And in this test, you told stories to the therapist uh, or to the evaluator, and they learned from the stories. Then psychology got into looking at brain function and the Bender Gestalt test which was a, a test of brain function, was developed. And then the Wexler Bellevue Intelligence Scale, which was both a test for uh, brain function, uh, although that was not its primary uh, use by any means, but a, a test of intelligence and of various sub-areas of intelligence was developed. OK. Now. What happened then in the Second World War, as I've said, everybody who could participated. And the Second World War was an unusual war. Not like uh, you have grown up in, in a world where uh, people very understandably want to avoid war. Hopefully, everybody would want to avoid war. But when the Second World War came, the feeling in the United States was we should participate. And many other countries, obviously, were already been in the war for a few years. And so uh, psychologists were in, in invited and, and actually sought uh, to participate in the military. There were only 6,000 psychologists in the country. 1,500 of them went into the military. So uh, huge. And, and when you consider that many of them were not military age, that is, they were much older, most of the able psychologists actually got involved with the military. And the estimates are that in 1944 alone, over 60 million psychological tests were given to over 20 million people. I mean, that's how serious this was. Then, when we saw how many people were suffering emotional problems as a result of the war, psychologists really began to do psychotherapy. In those days, Psychotherapy meant doing psychoanalytic psychotherapy because that was kind of like the only theory uh, that really existed and that people paid attention to. So psychologists, although not trained as psychoanalysts, started doing psychoanalytic psychotherapy. And what happened was they found that they enjoyed it. They found that they were working with the, these highly motivated men, and in many cases, very frightened men. In the Second World War, some were women. And, uh, and they were getting better. So psychologists then began to see that applying what they had learned before, that is applying personality theory and applying what they knew about abnormal personalities uh, and helping people to get better was really enjoyable. And that changed the profession. Now, by the end of the Second World War, the military had diagnosed large numbers of people who suffered from some form of distress. And some of these people clearly were disturbed before the war, and their disturbance came out during the war. And others, it really was the war that, that caused the, the distress. Then there were also people returning from the war whose lives were changed because of the injuries they suffered. Brain injury, loss of limbs, people who were blind. Uh, so people were now confined to wheelchairs. 
Uh, people were confined to, uh, if they couldn't see, to, to certain uh, things they couldn't do. So there were all these new challenges that people uh, had to, to meet. And psychologists were brought in to try to help with these problems. And it really was fascinating what the military did. Uh, I did uh, most of my training in the Veterans Administration hospitals in Chicago, so I saw a lot of these veterans. And I can tell you the, uh, the, the culture, the psychological culture that existed really made a difference for people. For people who lost a leg or had a spinal cord injury, uh, especially spinal cord injuries because it meant they would be confined to wheelchairs. The military uh, put them in hospitals. Uh, they put aside a certain amount of money uh, so these people could like, buy a home and have the home th fixed so it could be ramped and things like that, get a special car. And basically the decision was made, now we're talking about young men who are like 25 years old. And basically the decision was made is you're not gonna work again. And we don't expect you to work, we'll give you a pension for life because you know you got injured in the war. What was fascinating was that the blind veterans did not seek that. The blind veterans said, look, don't give us this stuff. We don't want new houses and this kind of stuff. We want education and training. And so the blind veterans actually got all kinds of education, became very productive in all kinds of ways, and had a totally different life experience than those people who uh, suffered other injuries. And I happened to work in both a, a spinal cord injury uh, service and in a blind uh, service. And it was dramatically different. In the spinal cord injury service, I would say most of the people were depressed. Uh, because these were very young people and, and their life in a way to them was over. In the blind center, it was full of excitement and energy. And, you know, and people felt, I'm going to overcome this. And I'll tell you, I, it, it was so impressive. One of the things they did when you were in training, like for someone like me, the day you showed up at the blind unit, very first day they met you at the front door. You had never been in this unit. And they blindfolded you. And they made you live as a blind person for the first week you were in training. And you learned things that you would never learn by somebody telling you. I mean, when, when you suddenly find out that you kind of find your way around someplace you can't see, and you're gonna have to go down uh, and have a meal, and you get into a cafeteria line. You got a cane, and you got, a, and, and you got this plate. And you're trying to figure out, you know, what should I do with this? And you find out, you put the cane in, in, in your collar so that you can carry your tray. And then you have to have people tell you what there is, and you get the food you want. Then you've got to sit down, and you can't see the meal, and you have to eat. Now, the anxiety that creates in anybody, uh, and, and when you're walking down the hall, you know, you're always worried you're going to walk into somebody. So the idea that uh, being paranoid is just a normal experience for a blind person. But if you didn't live this way, you might not know it. So the VA put in all this energy into trying to uh, sensitize all of us who are going to work with the blind as to what they were really going through. And then the blind were, were so motivated, they, they became a totally different kind uh, of person than others who were suffering different disorders. Now, what happened as a result of all of this, though, is the, the VA began realizing that psychological intervention was going to be terribly important. There weren't psychologists available. So the VA decided they needed between 4,500 and 5,000 psychologists that uh, would work uh, with people who had come back from the war and who needed help. And in order to do that, they said, we'll pay for it. So they began offering scholarships and training opportunities to people who would uh, get trained. And, they, and they didn't, you didn't have to go to the VA afterwards. It was up to you. Uh, in my case, the VA paid for three years of my doctoral studies. And I did three years of training and treatment in the VA hospitals. And later on, I became a consultant uh, to the VA. But some of the people who were in graduate school with me not only did what I did, but after they got their degree, they stayed with the VA. And some of those people are now with the VA for 40 years, uh, running services, uh, offering all kinds of uh, opportunities. But the VA uh, being willing to fund all this training made the field of clinical psychology. Uh, that is, for that generation, for my generation, that was really uh, the impetus
that allowed people to get trained and, and be funded. And, and because the VA encouraged uh, psychotherapy, that psychologist got a lot of training, both in testing and in psychotherapy and in consultation. Now, parallel to that, by the way, the United States Public Health Service also saw this need, and so they put a lot of money into the training of psychologists. And so the, the United States Public Health Service and the VA became those who really funded uh, what would happen. Now, the next thing I want to do is to, to talk a little bit about the model uh, for psychology. How did psychology in, in evolve into the model that it currently has? Well, in 1947, they had a committee uh, called the Committee on Training and Clinical Psychology. And it was chaired by a man named David Shackow. And they decided to, uh, to look at how should psychologists be trained. And they came up with, with some very uh, interesting observations. They felt that psychologists should be scientists. And this is where that idea that psychologists are trained in research comes from. They felt psychology is a research discipline. And so psychologists should be trained first as scientists and then as practicing professionals. And they also uh, came up very importantly that psychologists should be trained as rigorously in clinical uh, work as they were being trained in science because they were worried at the time that psychologists would get a lot of very first class scientific training, but maybe not such good clinical training. So Shackow's committee said, no, no, we, we've got to do all of this very well. And they said that psychologists should all do a year internship as part of their doctoral program. And uh, this was all new now. None of this, this wasn't at all what was going on uh, when Shackow started this. Now, two years later then, in 1949, uh, Shackow's report was presented to what has become probably the most famous national conference in psychology called the Boulder Conference. And this took place in Boulder, Colorado. And out of it came what is called the Boulder Model. And the Boulder Model is the scientist-practitioner model is, is what we... And Th th today, when you talk about the scientist practitioner model or the Boulder model, those are synonymous. And they mean what I've been saying, uh, namely, that psychologists are trained to be experts as scientists, they're trained to be experts as diagnosticians and treatment people. And now, the, the training in clinical psychology grew dramatically after this conference. I mean, this kind of gave academic uh, okays to those programs that really wanted to train clinicians. Back in 1948, there were 22 APA-approved clinical training programs. 22 programs in 1948, pretty much in all the, the top universities in the country. 55 years after that, there were 187 uh, clinical training programs. So you had an eight-fold increase. However, that really doesn't tell the, uh, the whole story because not only uh, did you have this dramatic increase, but those 187 programs were taking many more students each than were the programs, uh, those 22 programs, who probably just took a handful of students. And Independent schools of professional psychology were developed. These were schools that uh, were accredited, uh, but they often operated independent of universities, or sometimes they operated within a university, but they were a unit unto themselves. And these groups began training, like taking even as many as 100 students a year. And they offered two degrees. Some offered the traditional PhD, but some offer what's called the PsyD, Doctor of Psychology. And we'll talk a bit about the PsyD, but the significance of it is it was the beginning of steps 
to recognize that psychologists, that, that many, many young people going into psychology really want an education in how do you do diagnosis and treatment. So let's start emphasizing diagnosis and treatment. And the PsyD degree, while there is a, a substantial amount of scientific training, it is not nearly as rigorous as you find in a PhD degree. Now, what happened then, by the way, I just have to make one shift here. Uh, Scott, how do I get to back to the uh, original page here? Up arrow. Hmm? Up, no. Up arrow would take me back to the... No, I want to get to the next icon. Okay. Okay, escape. Okay, it's not... Uh, it's not showing up that way. Sorry for this... Uh, Okay. Can I just close? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll, I'll. That's okay, that's where I want to get. Fine. No, uh, okay, this will get me to my folder. Okay, thank you. Okay, sorry for that interruption. Okay, here we are. Sorry for that. A series of conferences have taken place since this Boulder conference. Uh, and you'll read about, there's not very much material, but you read some of it in chapter uh, 14 of your book. But uh, I'm going to, to give you this stuff now. This is some of the drier stuff you'll have in this course. But it, uh, it, it kind of completes this theme. Now, there was a conference in Miami in 1958. And th this is typical of how these conferences went. Most psychological conferences, about 100 people get invited representing all the specialties in psychology. Uh, most of the people come from universities, but not all. Some will come from hospital settings. Some will come from private practice. Some will come from government agencies. And they kind of represent a melding of the people in psychology uh, who are seen as kind of being on the forefront of things or who have significant positions. And so uh, they meet to kind of assess the field, and then they make a report on the field. And, uh, and what's been striking throughout the history of all these conferences is that every time there is such a conference, the, what, what happens is psychology ends up uh, kind of raising the issue, should we continue with the scientist-practitioner model, or should we go to another model? And people debate it and debate it and debate it, but they always end up saying, we should continue with the scientist-practitioner model. It is what makes psychology the distinctive discipline that it is. And so while this uh, gets brought up over and over again, and of the, the, these, many clinical, uh, these many conferences that have uh, been held, and I've, I've attended about 12 of them, so I feel very familiar. Uh, and, and in fact, I've organized some of them, so I feel quite familiar with what goes on in them. It is amazing how. Uh, when we begin to challenge what psychology does, we end up saying, actually, we like what we're doing, and we don't want to change it that much. Now, there have been some things that have, uh, that have changed 
and that are important. If you'll notice here in this Miami conference, uh, they actually established a curriculum uh, for psychology so that students getting doctoral degrees would have some similarities. Specialty training was introduced. Before that, we didn't talk much about, you know, uh, gerontological psychologists or health psychologists or people like that. They began to realize that specialty training was important. And also, uh, they began to realize that we had not devoted as a discipline much time to talking about the tr actual training. We talked about what goes on in the classroom, but we didn't talk about what goes on in internships. And they introduced postdoctoral education. Postdoctoral education has been fascinating for psychology. We have dealt with this over and over again. Uh, many conferences we've come up with the conclusion that actually you should do an internship pre-doctorally, that would be a year, and then you should do another year postdoctorally. Several conferences have come out and said that's what should happen. Uh, in fact, in health psychology, myself and a number of, of other uh, leaders in that field published an article describing exactly what the pre-doctoral internship would look like in health psychology and what the postdoctoral internship would look like. There have been other people who have developed uh, models for uh, neuropsychology and other fields. It's never been accepted. Everybody thinks we should have more training, but when it comes down to, are we going to mandate it? We, we have never mandated it. We've simply tried to provide more opportunities. Now, in 1965, at the Chicago conference, this conference was important because previously, when John Kennedy was uh, president of the United States, he signed the Mental Health Centers Act. And that was another initiative after the VA, which provided all kinds of jobs for psychologists and exciting jobs to work uh, in the mental health field. And so the question here was, how are we going to train people? And you'll notice in here uh, that there's a significant focus on social concern. Uh, this was, you know, the 60s were turbulent times and, and there was a strong feeling that psychology really had something to offer our culture. That is that just studying psychology could help people to cope with a lot of the stress in their lives, with a lot of the challenges that people were, were trying to deal with. But we never came up with a very effective way to get that message across. Uh, there was some discussion of uh, undergraduate curriculum and how uh, we might really have a, an, and there was a lot of enthusiasm, interestingly enough, for the undergraduate curriculum. However, psychology has never been able to deal effectively with what do we do with people who get master's degrees? Because the licensing acts in all 50 states in this country uh, and jurisdictions, they're all for doctoral psychologists. That is, there, there are things called licensed mental health specialists and things like that, that people with master's degrees in psychology can get. But if you want to call yourself a psychologist in the United States, you must have a doctoral degree. Now, why this is important is that people who have master's degrees obviously have a lot of education. And many people who are doing therapy and the, throughout the, the state hospitals in our country are people with master's degrees in psychology. But we don't allow them to call themselves a psychologist. And since we've never figured out what to do, we avoid the issue. And, and it's very sad because every year we graduate about a thousand people who have doctorates in psychology. We graduate 12,000 people who have master's degrees in psychology. And we still haven't figured out what to do with them. Nursing has no problem dealing with people who have BAs, uh, MAs, PhDs. Social work has no problem with it. But psychology, uh, and, and, and in uh, so, social work, you have bachelor's degree people, master's degree people, PhD people, and doctor of social work people. But psychology has just not been able to deal with it. Back in 1965, they were raising this issue at the Chicago conference. They still haven't solved it. Uh, and importantly, at the Chicago conference, they focused on psychologists as independent practitioners. These were the years, by the way, in which states were just beginning to license psychologists to practice. Before this, you could just, anybody, you didn't have to have a doctorate in psychology, you could just call yourself a psychologist because the term psychologist and clinical psychologist was not a, a legal term. So it was, it was free use for anybody who wished to declare themselves that way. And this became the time when they began to focus very heavily on we must get licensing laws, which exist in every state now, and we must uh, get serious about limiting the use of this term. Now then in 1973, when the Vail Conference came, 
the, this was the first time that they began to focus on the idea that psychology training ought to be broader than just being in, in colleges of arts and sciences, which is still the, the main center for where it, uh, training occurs. But people began to see the wisdom of having doctoral programs uh, in colleges of education, uh, especially uh, counseling and school psychology often are there, uh, of having independent schools of psychology, and also offering doctoral degrees in medical schools. And uh, the PhD program that I was involved with at Northwestern uh, was in the medical school. And one of the things that we learned was uh, our students loved the program because it was so real world. I mean, they saw people every day who had the disorders that they talked about in the classroom. I mean, our students from the first year were exposed to schizophrenics, were exposed to hospitalized psychotic patients, were exposed to people uh, who were drug addicted, alcoholic, uh, people in need of long-term psychotherapy, people in need of crisis intervention, et cetera. It was a wonderful place for people to be educated. And this was the first conference that said, we really have to, to look at this. It also was the first conference that really looked at affirmative action and said, we are doing a horrible job uh, with minorities in our field. We have almost no minorities. And uh, yet we have minority populations that are tremendously in need of psychological intervention. And this w w the push began uh, with this conference. Uh, also, this uh, conference proposed that students begin their clinical training in year one. There was been a resistance up to this time to letting students, until they took the basic courses, get any clinical training. They decided here that actually, in year one, some exposure to the client population was a good idea, and it probably would work best with psychological testing. Then the American Psychological Association had a conference in 1976, and they brought together two important concepts. They said that we needed to accredit programs. That is, if you're going to offer a PhD program in clinical psychology, the student ought to be guaranteed that at least there will be certain contents of a certain quality. And also they began talking about credentialing in psychology, or I should say advancing the idea of licensure. I'm not going to discuss the next conference here, Arden House, until we talk about health psychology, except to tell you that the Arden House conference was the landmark college in health psychology. It is what made the field. And I will tell you more about that later. Now, uh, there have been conferences on internship training and postdoctoral education. Uh, there's been a conference, the Florida conference I'm just showing you here, was on the scientist practitioner model. We had it 40 years after the uh, conference that took place in Boulder. And basically, we came up with the same conclusions, that psychologists ought to be trained as scientist practitioners. Also, uh, there have been three famous conferences here in Houston in which this university has played a great role. There was a national conference on service needs for the seriously mentally ill, which Dr. Dale Johnson ran. And this was the first national conference that I recall where we really brought in people, not only psychologists, but we brought psychiatrists and nurses and others in. It was held right on this campus uh, and really addressed. In the, and we also brought in, by the way, uh, the families of mentally ill people. And it was a very successful conference. That was followed by the, an international conference in neuropsychology that Dr. Julia Hene ran. And then finally, a conference on counseling psychology uh, that Dr. Bob McPherson ran. Uh, so, and then those are all psychologists right here. So this university has had a huge role in, uh, in really looking and trying to examine psychology and, and try to move the field forward. Well, that finishes this for now, and I realize I rushed through that, but we've got much to cover, and we'll start in the next session.